All right, we are live. Uh, it's Michael Wong, Southeast Veterinary Neurology in Miami. Um, please go ahead and, uh, if, you're, if you're watching, thanks. Um, go ahead and share this on your page, please, and that way we can get hopefully some good questions and good dialogue going today. Um, a couple different things. One, I'm not going to be doing this next week. Um, we are opening the Jupiter location of Southeast Veterinary Neurology, and uh, I will be up there uh, helping to, to make sure that gets off on the right foot. So next Thursday or next Wednesday, we're, we're not going to be doing um, the Q&A. So get your questions answered this week. Uh, again, if you're watching, go ahead and share it, please. That would really, really help, um, help us help as many people as possible today with these things. Hey, Kelly, are you there? Hey, I'm here. How are you? Good. All right, perfect. Oh, You've got video working too. Okay, how do I go flip this? Okay, can't wait. Perfect. So, so I, I guess tell us a little bit about you, um, where, where you're from and what's going on with your dog. Um, I, I've got some information here, but if you can, uh, just sort of fill me in on, on what kind of dog and uh, just, okay. just fill us yeah, in. He's on video here. Oh, I see um, him. He, we're from Salt Lake City. Um, his name is Bacchus. He's nine years old. He's a bull mastiff mix. He's okay. eight years old. Sorry. Um, he suffered FCE in his low back in December. Um, and we've done all sorts of therapies with him, rehab, um, electroacupuncture. The question I have is that his leg, no matter what ROM exercises we do, it's stiff, straight. Okay. And I've noticed actually when he's trembling, um, when he's asleep, not like, you know, dreaming, but like, like his nerves will just tremble from his front to his back end. And he, um, his leg will actually loosen up. Okay. Are, are you able to loosen it enough that, that it will bend or it just loosens a little bit? Like, I, I guess if... It actually loosens a lot where it's bent all the, like, all the way, like the same as his other leg. Okay. Interesting. So how was he diagnosed with an, an FCE? What, what were the, the symptoms and... Um, I mean, did it come on suddenly, and it, was it just that back left leg that was affected? Uh, it came on suddenly, like he just gone outside, he ran inside, he kind of yelped, fell, and then like didn't even realize he was, something happened because he was like trying to scratch his back. And um, so we rushed him over to the ur uh, urgent care right away, and they did an MRI the next morning. And then the neurologist said that he had like a, you know, the embolism happened between like his L3 to L5 area. Okay. Um, and it was his like, his whole lower half had, he was like paralyzed, like everything. And he barely had any deep pain sensation left in his left leg. Um, and like, but he was able to poop. He's not able to pee by himself. Now he'll dribble a little bit, like on command. Um, but he's able to hold his bladder. And uh, I mean, you can see now, like the leg is trembling. So yeah, we, I guess to, to me, what, what I'm seeing there, I mean, it, the, the leg looks really skinny to me for a dog his size. And, and yeah, it looks right. like it's kind of held out rigidly. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess for, for people watching, uh, a fibrocartilaginous embolism is when a, a little bit of disc material makes its way into the blood supply of the spinal cord and, and blocks the, the blood supply to the spinal cord. So it's, it's kind of like a stroke. Um, and the symptoms usually, usually come on suddenly. Uh, dogs can act painful at first, but then within 12, 24 hours, they shouldn't be painful. Um, it often happens when they're being active, so they're running around in the backyard chasing a, a frisbee, <coughs> excuse me, chasing a frisbee, etc. Um, it usually affects one leg more than the other. 
Um, the way we diagnose it is via ruling out other things that can look like it, like slip discs and tumors and meningitis. Um, and an MRI is a big part of that. Uh, surgery isn't necessary and typically uh, the treatment is time and physical therapy. Some of the, the things that I think you're experiencing that make the prognosis not quite as good as most dogs with, a, um, with an FCE are, are a couple things. One, just the, 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 the severity. It sounds like um, he didn't lose feeling, but had very minimal feeling in that back left leg. So, so inability to, to feel the leg is a prognostic indicator. And the other thing that worries us when we hear of a dog with an FCE is, is it affecting sort of the L4 to S3 spinal cord? Because that's where the nerves that supply the leg, where, where their, their origins are, or their, what their neuro, what's called their neuronal cell bodies are located. So when we have a problem there, um, just the damage can be more severe and um, more long lasting. So, um, so, so thank you for, for that. I, I guess with regards to your, your questions of, you know, why is he atrophied in that leg or why is it stiff? And, and more importantly, what, what can I be doing uh, to try and help that? It's, it, he's atrophied there because where the stroke was, well, probably for two reasons. He's atrophied there because of where the stroke was actually damaged the origins of the, the nerves to the legs. So the neuronal cell bodies. And when we damage those, that is usually more severe and more permanent than if we just damage the, um, what we call the axon or the, or the extension of, of, the, of that nerve. Um, so that's one reason that we're seeing atrophy. The other is probably just disuse. So him not using the leg as much. Okay. So from a what could you be doing or what should you be doing, it sounds like you're doing a, a lot of the right things. And, you know, um, my area of expertise isn't necessarily the, the rehabilitation side. So, you know, the, the rehab doctor, the acupuncture doctor, the, um, they, they uh, are more versed in the actual rehab standpoint. Um, but those are the things that we would be recommending things like acupuncture, things like physical therapy, swimming. Uh, it's, yeah. uh, sometimes there's only so much you can do. So I don't want you to feel like, you know, you haven't done enough rehab or, you know, your, your rehab doctor hasn't done enough. Sometimes just the damage is severe enough, especially when I hear things like lost feeling or almost lost feeling that, that you know, this is probably, it is what it is. Um, okay. So my question is just why, like when he's trembling, like earlier, but like he's doing it from his, you know, front paws down his back all the way to his back legs. Why is it then that his leg is like, it's able to bend almost to normal? And, and what does, is, is it that you're able to put, so I guess I'm envisioning right now that the leg's stiff and if you push on it, you know, his, his hip, yeah. his, his knee. It, it's it, long. It's, it's all locked. And, yeah. and what happens if you kind of um, tickle the toes there, if you sort of uh, pinch on the toes? He'll just flex it a little bit like that. Okay. Oh, he can't see. Uh, just, I, I, it's just a little bit of flexion right here. Okay. But and then, it, go ahead. Um, when he's trembling like ill, bend all the way to normal, like this leg will, like all the way. Um, I, I guess interesting, and I, I think you, you, can, you can start to tell that I might not have the actual answer for, for why that happens. Many times when dogs have an injury and I see them atrophied this much, they can get what's called a contracture, where just the, the muscles no longer, um, the, the, the joints no longer have mobility, the muscles are kind of uh, just, contracted into a position. But when that happens, usually it, it shouldn't be intermittent. It should be kind of just always locked out. So um, it's, okay. it's interesting that, that you say at times when he's having these tremors uh, that, that it will come all the way up. Because um, when you pinch the toe there, it looked like you know he wasn't able to withdraw the, the limb. Okay. So, 
tremors are kind of one of the harder things for me to tell people what they mean. Um, right. But even more so with your question of when he's having tremors, why is he able to flex it? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, okay. How does he get around? I mean, if you get him up, will he will he use that leg and advance it at all? Will he use it even as just like a peg leg, or does it completely just drag behind him? Um, no, he'll actually use it. In the house, is more peggish. Like he doesn't take as big of steps, and is not as wide a range. But when we go outside into the yard, he'll take almost to normal steps with it. Yeah, I mean, really, that that's the most important thing to us. And, you know, what what we, I guess, get happy about is, you know, a dog that couldn't walk is now walking, um, okay. even if it isn't, even if it isn't perfect. Um, okay. So not not to say that you shouldn't try to continue to give him as much as you can to continue to rehabilitate him. Um, you know, I, I still would, I would still continue with the rehab, etc. Um, okay. But, but I think some of this is just you know, what are the realistic expectations? You know, I doubt that he's ever going to be 100%, but he's pain-free, he's walking, um, he seems very happy sitting with you there. Um, yeah. Okay, all right, thank you very much. You got it. Sorry I didn't have a, a more specific answer for you, but... Uh, no, that was great. He seems super happy. Super yeah, he's, oh, he's yeah. just a happy guy. All righty. Well, very nice meeting you, thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Well, hello there, Lindsay. How are you? Um, Lindsay's one of my uh, my uncharted vet friends, and uh, I'm sorry I haven't seen you in the last couple of years. I hope you're doing very well. Um, her question is, what situations are appropriate to consider a wheelchair for dogs? Um, so uh, I, I guess there are a couple different reasons. The most common reason that, that I'm um, giving a wheelchair for a dog is that dog that is paraplegic, absent deep pain perception, so category five, and whether I've done surgery and they're the 50% that doesn't regain the ability to walk, or um, if they're paraplegic, no deep pain, and for some reason the owners cannot pursue surgery, sort of the 85-90% the chance that they're in a wheelchair. So, so reason number one is a dog with a slipped disc or some sort of severe injury to the spinal cord, most commonly a slipped disc, but other times, you know, uh, my, my dog had a broken back. She was hit by a car. Um, you know, dogs, uh, dogs like Bacchus that we just talked with, um, that if that injury, like an FCE, was severe enough that we were paraplegic, no deep pain in both limbs and we didn't recover, um, those are the times that, that we would use it. So a dog that has a severe injury that is just never going to walk again and we want to give it more mobility. Um, kind of the, the second time that, that we use it um, is for dogs that just have some mobility left, but um, they just can't get up and, and walk uh, on their own, or they have a hard time walking around. So we'll get dogs with degenerative myelopathy, dogs with, um, you know, I have a couple dogs with uh, inflammatory CNS disease. I have a couple dogs, um, a, a handful of, of pugs that get a condition called a, a subarachnoid diverticulum um, that just, they still have some function, but uh, they're just not able to get up and walk. So, um, we use them for, for them. So pretty much any time that we need to add mobility. Um, one of the times that I see dogs getting into wheelchairs where um, isn't really part of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but I've seen some neurologists and some rehab uh, veterinarians that it's when a dog is recovering after surgery, you know, they'll get them into a, a wheelchair really, really quickly. And I tend to still err more on the side of resting um, post-surgery just a little bit more. Um, so I'm not quite as fast to get them into a wheelchair as their, as their rehab post-surgery. Um, but uh, we've got another question uh, from Michaela. Uh, my dog has GME and is three months on prednisone. She's reacting poorly to it. 
and due to muscle atrophy and leg injury is currently not walking much and can't get up on her own. Her initial symptoms were mostly walking around in a circle and bumping into objects. How can I recognize if during prednisone tapering she relapses when I can't look for symptoms involving walking now? Thanks. Um, so, so good, good question. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I assume your dog's been diagnosed with GME via MRI and spinal tap. Um, are we just on prednisone or are we also on uh, secondary immunosuppressants? Um, and, and I guess as I ask, ask these questions, if you can actually re reply under your thread, that'll make it easier for, uh, for Emily to kind of find your responses. So I'm, I'm assuming that your dog's been diagnosed by MRI and spinal tap um, and that we're on potentially other medications other than prednisone. Um, if we're not on medications other than prednisone, that's something to consider in that um, prednisone does have a lot of side effects. Uh, prednisone causes dogs to drink more, pee more, pant more, increase appetite. Like, you, like you're saying, um, we can get muscle atrophy. Um, and uh, it's uncommon for me to see the muscle atrophy get to the point that the dog can't walk. So my concern would be, is that actually a progression of the neurological disease? Is that progression of the GME that is causing your pet to not be able to walk? Um, so with regards to your, your actual question of, you know, what can I be looking for from a relapse standpoint if I'm not able to look for the same symptoms of walking in circles and bumping into things if I'm not, if my pet isn't walking? Um, that, that is tough. And some of those things, what we'd be looking for in the hospital would be, um, other, other changes, so blindness on one side of the body, abnormal eye movements, um, those are things that a, a lay person may not you know, be able to reliably recognize. Um, obviously, if there was something like a seizure, when I hear things of walking in circles, it makes me worry that your dog, uh, the, the, the GME was located in the front part of the brain, which one of the symptoms we can see with a front part of the brain uh, localization is seizures. That would be something for, uh, for you to notice and would be relatively easy for a, a pet owner to, to notice. Um, but other things, you know, nystagmus, um, postural reaction deficits, reflexes, things like that, those are the things to be going to your veterinarian or your veterinary neurologist for. So we've got a question here. Can we explain how spinal walking works? A, a, I guess a, a short version. So usually we'll see spinal walking um, in animals that have had a severe spinal cord injury sort of in the mid-back spinal cord. So the information making from the brain to the front legs or the thoracic limbs is normal. So those dogs are usually pulling, um, using their front limbs normally, but they have a mid-back spinal cord injury that is severe enough to make it that that pet no longer can voluntarily move the legs or feel the legs. By voluntarily move, I mean the information, the brain sending information down the spinal cord through the back to the legs to say, okay, move your legs purposefully. Um, we do not have that information that, that can make it through the back. Reflexes are still intact. So by a reflex, I mean, and pretend this is my back leg and this is my, my knee as opposed to my elbow. Um, you know, when you tap on your knee, you get a knee jerk reflex, or what we call a patellar reflex. And that's something that doesn't require your brain input at all. You know, without thinking, um, if someone taps on your knee, you're sitting on the, the table, it's, it's going to jerk automatically. Um, so that's just information that goes from the receptors in your knee up to the spinal cord of, uh, of your lower back. And again, pretend that this is my, my, my pelvis and my, my back leg, and then right back down. So that's what a reflex is. It's something that's hardwired and doesn't require uh, brain or cortical input in order to happen. So... In dogs that have a severe mid-back spinal cord injury, the reflexes, um, one, they're still intact, but two, they can be become exaggerated. And what we'll see is, you know, one leg goes out and the other one comes up and that causes the reflex to do the opposite. And then it does the opposite and then the opposite. So it can look like very herky-jerky um, robotic movements that they're, they're rhythmic, um, they're, they're not purposeful, uh, but sometimes, especially in smaller dogs, corgis, dachshunds, 
you know, we're, we're able to get those working in a rhythmic enough fashion to lift that short little dog off the ground and, and it looks like they're walking. Um, and it, I guess technically they're walking because they're up on, on all four. Um, it's usually not uh, coordinated. It's not on purpose, um, but many dogs can get around and do you know, several steps or sometimes even many steps with that. Um, I, I frequently see it in, in cats that have severe spinal cord injury. Um, along with that, many times those dogs are typically those dogs and cats are still urinary and or fecal incontinent. Something that we also see is when you stimulate a leg, um, it can elicit that leg going up and the other one going down, but it might also elicit that uh, dog to poop or pee right then. So um, my dog, again, she was hit by a car, you know, 11 years ago, um, and she eventually developed these rhythmic spinal walking movements, um, but was never able to ambulate on her own, but she had these, these rhythmic uh, movements. Uh, Cameron. Our dog suffered an FCE about two months ago and was paralyzed completely on the left side and had right-sided weakness. He's using three of his legs almost normally now and can walk on his own, but he limps on his left front leg and doesn't bear full weight on it. His back leg also slips behind him occasionally when he is walking. Is there a way to tell if this will ever resolve? Um, so it sounds like your dog had an FCE in the neck. Um, it sounds like the left side was more affected than the right. And we've gone from being unable to walk where the left side was really bad and the right side um, was okay um, or was less affected. Um, but now we can walk on all four, but our, I'm assuming back left leg slips behind him occasionally when he's walking and the left leg doesn't bear full weight on it. Um, I guess I'm envisioning more that it's not that we're holding the leg up, but that um, we're, we were sort of offsetting our weight onto our right side. Um, so again, I'm also going to assume that, um, you know, we, we have an MRI diagnosis, even without an MRI diagnosis, it's, you know, probably a slip, excuse me, probably an FCE if we weren't painful and if we've improved this much. But um, so answering your question, is there a way to tell if it will ever, um, a, a, ever resolve? Um, we usually set you know pet parents up that um with fce that it may never completely resolve people get kind of focused on um you know will my dog be normal and we kind of like to uh um qualify what you know what success means uh, when we have a dog that isn't walking in um for a dog like yours i would call this a success we were unable to walk and now we're walking we're ambulating we're pain free etc um Will your dog continue to improve? Um, my answer would be probably. Again, my challenge is not having the full picture and not having examined your, your pet. But in general, dogs with FCEs, if it's not affecting an intumescence, so if it's not affecting right where the nerves come out to the leg, um, and if they still have feeling or still have nociception, you know, we usually say 90 plus percent chances of having a, a positive outcome, meaning able to walk, et cetera. Um, so will it ever resolve? Um, will your dog ever be 100% normal where you can never tell that this ever happened two months ago? I'd say probably not, um, but will your dog continue to improve from here? Being that it's only been two months, probably. So. Uh, spinal cord injury, especially FCEs, it can take a long time to get as good as we're going to get. But might we plateau at a, you know, a nine out of ten as opposed to a ten out of ten? Um, sure, that's certainly possible. The the things that we see, sort of the last things to come back, are knowledge of where that foot is in space. So that's the things that it sounds like you're describing, where the legs are slipping out, and that's kind of one of the first things to go away in a spinal cord injury and one of the last things to come back. So um, we like to give it as much time as possible. You know, if you're able to do physical therapy, I'd encourage that. If you're not, you know, gentle walks, um, you know, getting him up from a, a laying position to a standing position, uh, getting him to stand, put more pressure on that left side than the right side. Um, 
are, are all things that you could be doing. But will it ever resolve? Don't know. Um, we will probably never be 100%, but again, I can't answer that uh, with certainty. But my experience is dogs with, uh, with FCEs, some of them get back to 100%, but many of them have residual deficits. Um, FC survivor, three years out and having issues as a senior large lab with splitting and having recent issues with the knee on his weakest leg. His mobility is good. He has little bowel control in his bladder retention and has bladder retention, but can empty his bladder marking on walks. Walking is critical to his bladder health. He walks five miles a day, but lately is having trouble getting up and is knuckling. He splits and struggles. This is new. Um, the vet took radiographs, no arthritis and no obvious injury. I've seen braces and compression wraps for knees. I bought a non-skid booty for the bad leg, which he tolerates fine. He is allergic to NSAIDs, takes gabapentin or shortening his walks. Acupuncture helped in the past, but that is not available during COVID right now. Is there anything more we can do at home to help strengthen the muscles and help his knee? So um, I guess when I hear, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, so we had an FCE three years ago. We improved from that. Um, but more recently, I'm going to say, you know, over the last few months, we've been noticing getting worse. Um, correct me if I'm wrong there. When, when I hear of a senior lab that's kind of having this slow, uh, progressive in coordination in all four limbs and just a, I'm, I'm sort of picturing a, a sloppy an incoordinated gait in all four limbs, um, I often worry more about what's called a polyneuropathy. So um, not a brain problem, not a spinal cord problem of the neck or spinal cord problem of the back, but older labs will frequently get a nerve problem. So the nerves that start in the spinal cord and go out to the muscles of the limbs in, in all of the muscles. So not just the front legs, not just the back legs. Um, many times we can see weakness in the, the voice box. Um, so sometimes these dogs will have a bark change. Um, so uh, that's kind of what I'm picturing based off of, of your description. Um, I guess the, the primary recommendation for all of this, I, I think it's a little complicated for, for me to answer, but I, you know, you're going to your vet, you've done radiographs, you've obviously tried medications. Um, I think evaluation by a, a neurologist to get a better sense of does this look more like a polyneuropathy. Um, there are various causes of polyneuropathy um, in, in dogs, inflammation of the, of the nerves, tumors of the nerve, infection of the nerve, um, metabolic things like hypothyroidism, et cetera, um, diabetes, things like that. But the most common thing that I see in older labs would be a degenerative cause or a familial cause. Um, so going and seeing a neurologist to one, make sure that I'm not way off in what I'm assuming based off of your, your description or just based off of age and breed and, and et cetera. Um, being able to confirm that yes, it looks more like a peripheral nerve problem as opposed to a cervical spinal cord problem or something else, just because that, in neurology, it's so important first to say, is it a neurological problem? And then say, where is it? Because based on where the local, where the problem is, what the localization is, that sort of determines what our list of possible causes is and determines what our uh, tests that we will recommend to try and find the cause so that we can make a course of action to try and help. Um, with regards to braces, compression wraps, um, Certainly outside of my, my wheelhouse uh, with regards to um, you know, my area of expertise, uh, um, rehab doctors, your primary care veterinarian uh, would, would all be able to better answer that question in your dog's particular case. Sandy, our girl was diagnosed uh, towards the end of November with autoimmune GME. She is off of prednisone now. It has been about three weeks. She's doing wonderful. Um, her only symptom was a status seizure. She is still on cyclosporin and zanisamide. They want to keep her on the zanisamide for one year to make sure she stays seizure free. She's a four-year-old Sheltie. She's also receiving acupuncture and three holistic medications. Our neurologist told us a third of dogs will never need medication again. A third always need medication. A third won't respond. We're hopeful that she'll be in the, the top third 
Um, do you see very many dogs go into a permanent remission? Our girl had an MRI and spinal tap. Thank you. Um, so, um, so how old of a Sheltie? Four-year-old Sheltie uh, had a, a seizure um, and she's on, she was on prednisone, still on cyclosporin, which is a, another immunosuppressant and zanisamide, um, has been seizure-free since and is doing well. So um, we already talked a little bit about GME. It's typically autoimmune. It's when the body's defenses attack the own, um, attack the body. Um, the analogy we use is like lupus, when it, your defenses attack your internal organs. Rheumatoid arthritis is when your body's defenses attack your joints. Meningitis or meningoencephalomyelitis is when the body's defenses attack your own brain, spinal cord or coverings of the brain and spinal cord. It's typically autoimmune, um, meaning that there's not an infectious cause like a, a bacteria or a virus or something like that. The treatment for me is prednisone as you know, kind of the cornerstone, and then I add in a secondary immunosuppressant, such as the atopica or cyclosporin that, that your pup's on. Um, oftentimes we'll use a drug called cytosar or cytarabine here, um, but atopica or cyclosporin is one of the ones that we use frequently as well. Um, I like to use them in combination. Sometimes dogs, we need to get them off the prednisone faster. So the secondary immunosuppressant um, does more of the, of, of the work. Lots of different neurologists are, have, have different protocols with that. So I know some that will you know, take off prednisone completely just like yours. Um, some that wean or, or decrease it on um, a, a, a sliding schedule, you know, whereas as, uh, we tend to, um, do it more based off of an, an amount of time, obviously depending on how the dog's doing. Um, with regards to prognosis, yeah, kind of a third um, doing great, a third being on lifelong therapy and a third not responding at all is similar to the numbers that, that we quote. Um, it's kind of the, the numbers that we'll say is kind of a, a 40, 40, 20. So 40% do great, never look back, never have a relapse, 40% um, have relapses and require lifelong medications and 20% don't respond um, at all. And no matter whether we give them prednisone or cytarabine or cyclosporin or you know, medication four, five, six, or 10, that they just don't respond. Um, there's been a, a more recent study that says that number is closer to 26%. Um, so, but we're all kind of in the same general um, general category with sort of, you know, 30, a third, a third, a third, or 40, 40, 20. Um, and it's not necessarily that our numbers are any better than anyone else's. It's just kind of, that's the, um, the way we explain it. Um, one of my things is, is relapses. If they happen, I usually say they're going to happen within the first six months or so. Um, so yes, I hope uh, your, your girl is out of the woods, um, but I would still be very vigilant in, in watching for signs of recurrence, um, especially as you've, you've weaned off of the prednisone. Um, and I'm sure your neurologist has kind of warned you of, of those things to be watching for. Um, so do we see many dogs go into a permanent remission? You know, yeah, 33 to 40% uh, would be the kind of the numbers that I see where dogs you know, uh, get better, stay better, and uh, you know, never look back. I'm a little slower with regards to ever taking dogs permanently off medications. You know, I just We're all shaped by our experiences, and I've had a handful of dogs where I've got them on this tiny dose of prednisone, and uh, you know, as the books say it, uh, shouldn't be doing anything. It's you know, below what the body already creates. But when I take those dogs off prednisone, you know, I've had some have relapses. So I've been a little bit more gun shy of taking dogs completely off medications. Um, but I do have some that are off prednisone and we're just using uh, the secondary immunosuppressants. Hello, hello, can you hear me all right? I don't hear your, your audio there, there we go. Hello. Hi, how are you? Thank you for seeing us, Dr. Wong. Oh, this, is, this is great. This is Winston. 
This is Winston. He was sleeping. I had to wake him up. <laughs> and Winston, was he 14, if I remember correctly? He'll be 14 in December. Okay. And I, I guess t tell us a little bit. I, I've got your information here, but go ahead and just tell us about Winston and um, what your concerns are and, and what's he doing. Okay, well, Winston is a pug, as you can see, and he lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And he has been having trouble with his back legs operating correctly, like they give out, like if he's on the tile floor especially, and he can't walk very far. He can't make it around the block. We sent you some videos. So that's his biggest problem. He doesn't, he has a weight problem. He's on a diet. So when his legs and and I've seen the videos um, and 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 yeah he doesn't want to doesn't want to move a whole lot I, I could see the the video where we were kind of out for a walk and he just kind of put on the brakes in the middle of the road and then when he got to the curb you know he didn't want to go up and over and we had to be lifted up and over. He can't go upstairs anymore either. And, and was that something sudden that came on or was that something? I think it, it was about six months ago it started so it wasn't. I don't think it was gradual, and we thought maybe it was because he was getting old. Sure. I, I guess, do you ever see, I, I didn't really notice in any of the videos, but do you ever see where his, his feet turn over like that? Or is yeah. it more that he just sits down and plops down and... Plops down, or his feet slide, and he can't Therefore, stand up and pee. And, on him. Yeah, like that. And he can't um, lift one leg and go to the bathroom, but he does sometimes. Okay. And he has some random fecal in in incontinence. I guess tell me a little bit more about that. Well, um, he never used to go in the house or anything, except he had a problem like if we were gone, which I understand is typical of pugs. He wasn't easy to house train, but um, like in the morning, there might be a turd in his bed, at er bed area. Okay. Um, one time he was eating last week and a turd came out. And that was very unusual. What, 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 about, what about peeing? Do you, is he having any PP accidents? No. Okay. And in the videos that I saw, it looks like his tail is kind of nice and curled up and under. I mean, does he, he curls it up? Or does well, it? in the morning, he goes for a walk with my husband every day at like 5 a.m., but he eats right after that. So that's a very motivated time for him. And before dinner at 5, he's motivated but his tail does not stick up like it used to. He has a double curl and his tail used to always be up, but now it's mostly down. Does he seem painful to you? Like when you, when you pick him up? Um... No, because I'm like, I'm holding him right now, but I'm always careful to get his back legs, but he doesn't seem to be in pain, but he doesn't have, of course, the same energy that he used to, and he doesn't walk the way he used to. Oh, is there, is there any time of day that he's better or worse? Does, does he, is he, is he worse after resting or better after resting or is there no really rhyme or reason? He's kind of like this all day long. Um, he's like this all the time. Like I said, he's more motivated around mealtime okay. because he knows if I go for a walk or, you know, I'm going to eat soon. So like, and then every once in a while, he still will get up and kind of like lunge at the cat. So wh when he's motivated, does he walk well or does he still slip out and... Um, he will still slip out if he's on like a slippery surface. If anything's wet, like I have to pick up his water bowl because when he eats, he makes a big mess and it gets wet. And then the floor is tile. So his uh, back feet start slipping. And then he, one day he freaked out and his front legs got really stiff because he was afraid, you know. So the, the, the challenge, I mean, for any patient that we see, you know, we're trying to sort out, is this a neurological problem or yeah. or or not um, and you know based off of the video I, I don't see obvious things where um, it, it makes me think that it's a neurological problem so there are certain things that you're saying you know we I, I can uh, explain things like you know not wanting to, to go on long walks not wanting to go up the curb not wanting to go up the stairs you know with lots of other things other than a neurological problem you know heart right. problems uh, metabolic problems, uh, joint problems, hip problems, things like that can all cause dogs to, I guess, slow down. And like you had said before, you know, age. Things that suggest a neurological problem, when I hear things like, you know, slipping out 
that suggests a neurological problem. But I guess just on the videos that I saw, I don't really see where he's, he's buckling over in the legs. His gait um, doesn't look incoordinated to me so much as more short strided, like, you know, like, like bad knees or bad hips or, or you know, just that he feels sore. Um, so I guess I don't see anything that strongly suggests that, that it's a neurological problem. What are things that we could or should be doing? I, I saw the blood work that you had. I saw the, the EKG. You know, those are all good, good baseline tests. Um, obviously, I'm somewhat limited in what I can see, you know, from, you know, across the country uh, through, through Zoom. So, um, you know, there, there are neurologists in, in your area um, that I just think are going to be able to be able to look at them and say, yes, this is a neurological problem. And there are the, uh, this is where the problem is. And this is what the possible causes are. And these are the tests for us to try and figure out what we can do to try and help them. Or they might say, you know, nope, I don't see anything that strongly su suggests neurological disease. And I'm more worried that it's his knees, heart, hips, thyroid, what, whatever it may be. Um, so I, I just think someone seeing him in person, um, you know, and working in, in concert with your primary care, neurolo primary care neurologist, primary care veterinarian, um, just to be able to get a look at him in person. Um, okay. So, so uh, what I was trying to figure out is what to do next, because I don't have a referral to the local neurologist. Should he go there or should he have some other tests first? Um, I, I guess I would ask your veterinarian who's already seen him, you know, of, well, what, what's the next process? Do you think there are, in, in your experience and buying, by being able to look at Winston, you know, do you think meeting with a neurologist is reasonable or, you know, should we be meeting with an orthopedic doctor, an internal medicine specialist, et cetera? So, um, you know, from, from my view from afar, I don't see anything that's, that's screaming, you know, neurological problems. So um, I, I think someone in person could be able, would be able to better say that. Um, I think it all depends on who you've got locally, if they're neurologists, you know, more neurologists than orthopedic doctors that you can get into sooner, go that, go that route. If, you know, you have a surgeon around the block from you, but, you know, the neurologist is, you know, 40 minutes down the road. Maybe start with the orthopedic doctor. All righty. Okay. Well, thank you for your assistance and your help and your willingness to, to have a meeting with Winston. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I don't know if you know, I've, I've got pugs. My first dog was a pug. My, um, my, I, I currently I have two pugs, so they're, you know, I, 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 I love my pugs, so, um, and I see a lot of pugs with neurological disease, so I, I guess I don't see anything, you know, dramatic that makes me worried that Winston's whole problem is due to neurological disease. When I hear things like slipping out, that does raise a suspicion for neurological disease, um, but it's not uncommon to have two problems, orthopedic and neurological, at the same time, and just based off the video, I'm a little bit more worried about ortho disease over neuro disease. Okay. Well, I'll do some more investigating here. And of course, I'm willing to fly him to Miami. I don't care if there's a pandemic or not, because well, uh, I know how you must feel about your pugs because we've had him, I bought him for my dad and uh, my dad's no longer with us. And so he's part of our family. He's really, really part of our family. I, I, I get it. I get it. Rowdy's my Rowdy's my best friend, so that, that's that's my dog. So I'm, I'm okay. Well, thanks dogs. for taking a look and and seeing if any if you know if you saw anything obvious. And so um, he's wheezing a little bit, but I'll I guess I'll call the vet again and see if there's anything else they'll recommend. Sounds great, and I'm happy to get on the phone with your vet if if um, you know if they have okay. Questions. All right. Well, that'd be good. I I might have them do that and see if they will. I, I thank you so much. You got it. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Bye-bye. Miss Hood, um, I guess just if, if you go ahead and you watch us and we'll, we'll email you, just if there's any delay in me responding, like if your vet calls, just uh, 
next week we're opening our, our Jupiter location, so I'm not going to be in the Miami office. So there may be a bit of a delay from the time that if you if, if your vet calls, I'm not going to be in the Miami office for I think like a week and a half now, so two weeks. So if there's a delay, that's why. Um, uh, so Sarah has a question. My five-year-old dachshund has epilepsy and recently was prescribed phenobarbital, kepra, and zanisamide three months ago. She has recently stopped wanting to eat. Is this normal? Uh, that's not typically a, um, a side effect. In, in fact, usually phenobarbital, a side effect is dogs want to eat more and they, they drink more and therefore they pee more. Um, so that's not an expected side effect of, of any of those medications. Um, I would certainly go back to your veterinarian uh, and or your neurologist um, to have your, your puppy uh, examined. They're almost certainly going to want to do some blood work to make sure that uh, you know, metabolically, so liver, kidneys, electrolytes, blood sugar, things like that um, all look fine and uh, they'll probably want to do some, some x-rays of, of the chest and or belly um, to make sure that there isn't something in the abdomen that is maybe causing the, uh, the, the poor appetite. But um, not expected with those medications, not expected with, with dogs with seizures, um, would, would strongly recommend you going and seeing your veterinarian uh, for evaluation. Uh, so Zoe has a question. Um, what are the odds of a spinal stabilization surgery for hemivertebra? Oh, fa fa I got it. Failing in the future, my, my pug had her spine stabilized with pins and cement four months ago, and I'm worried that in the future the pins may move or crack. Um, I'm, I'm sure that that is your, your neurologist or your surgeon's concern as well. Just, um, you know, we, we always, let's say, we use the word worry, but we we want to make sure that there aren't complications um, of a spinal stabilization. And that is one of the complications that, uh, that can happen. Um, the, the complications that, that you know, we, we see with spinal stabilizations would be um, things like infection. So sometimes the implants can get infected. Sometimes the, the implants themselves can, can break. Um, so whether it's, I don't know if he said there was bone cement, but sometimes bone cement can break. Um, sometimes the plate can break. Sometimes the screws can, can break. Sometimes the, um, the actual implant, it stays together, but it pulls out of the bone. Um, so th those are all possible causes, or excuse me, possible complications um, that I'm sure your neurologist and surgeon, you know, um, was aware of those and worried about and took great, you know, went to great lengths to make sure that uh, things are going to go as well as possible. Um, and it's impossible for me to say the, the likelihood that um, the pins are going to move or crack. Um, the, the nice thing is the vertebral column isn't nearly as mobile as, you know, say the, 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 the limbs, so the actual um, movement uh, on them is not as great or the stresses aren't as great. Um, you know, the fact that we're a pug as opposed to, you know, say a Rottweiler, um, the amount of forces on that is not as great. Um, so I, I, I can't say, hey, no problems, guaranteed, you know, 100% uh, fixed, never a complication. Your, your surgeon and or neurologist, you know, would be able to better uh, answer that and help you, you know, feel, feel fine about it. I'm sure they're having you, you know, rest her, um, rest her, rest her and, and limit her activity. And, you know, I'm sure they've made a big deal of, you know, no jumping off of the, the bed and, you know, stuff like that at, at this point. So um, I'd say the things that we've got going for us, you know, we're, we're four months out already. Um, we're a relatively small dog and we, um, you know, are in a, a part of the, the body that doesn't have a lot of forces on them, um, relatively speaking. So, um, you know, my, my, my hope is that, um, I, I, my hope is that you're not going to have a problem with the, the pins breaking or, or cracking. I guess also to ease your mind, um, when we're stabilizing, the, the, the bones and cement are, are holding things until the bones can, can fuse. Um, so many times, even 
further down the line, if something were to happen, the, the body's healed and, and stabilized and fused in that position. So, um, so even if it breaks, it may not necessarily mean that you know anything else needs to be done because the body may be healed at that point. Um, uh, Haley asks, what do I feel about ocular compression for seizure control? Um, it's not something I, I ever do. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of it. Um, you know, it's, I don't know if my, my mind is, is so westernized at, at this point, but um, it's, it would be kind of number you know, 16 or 17 on, on the things that I, I am doing for a dog with a seizure. Um, so you know, medications, uh, if it's for an active seizure, drugs like midazolam, if it's you know, a dog that's just had a seizure and we're trying to prevent it from going into further ones, you know, there are other medications we give for that. But um, so I guess I wouldn't say, you know, I feel negatively towards it. It's just not something that I routinely recommend or um, I guess I've seen a, a, a positive benefit to. Um, is it normal for a dog with IVDD to, I assume you mean spinal walk one day and drag the next? Um, So uh, I, I'm assuming if, if in, in this, it's a dog that um, if we're spinal walking, we were paraplegic, no deep pain, and spinal walking to me is not voluntary walking. It's that those rhythmic jerks of, of the legs. Um, so it's not true voluntary locomotion. Um, so yes, those dogs, I'll, I'll even see where they, they spinal walk you know, they, they, they do 10 steps and then they drag right after that. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I've got enough information to uh, respond specifically to, to your dog, um, but dogs with spinal walking, you know, they're, they're usually never walking normally, so they will fall and drag frequently. Um, Dr. Fang, you're 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 welcome. Um, I'm glad you're you're getting something out of this. We're we're talking about doing a uh, um, a, a veterinarian version of this, so um, keep an eye out for that. Dr. Co Martin, glad you're here. Um, what about obturator paralysis in dogs? Um, so I, I, I've personally never seen or, or recognized it. Um, so my recollection of, um, and I guess, I guess cows, this is where I'm gonna start to sound really dumb. Um, you know, cows, when they'll kind of be on slick surfaces and they're, they slip and their legs split, splay out, um, they can, again, I'm, I'm using my front legs to represent my back legs, but that can actually pull on the obturator nerves, which are used to sort of um, ab adduct the limbs. Um, I've just never personally seen it in a, uh, in a dog. Um, yeah, this, this is really neat. We've got people from the UK, people from India. Um, looks like there's only, only one question I haven't answered, so we'll, we'll, we'll go up to it. Um, Uh, do I know anything about canine paroxysmal dyskinesia? Um, the sh short answer would be those are the sorts of things that I, I, I see or recognize that I'm seeing so infrequently that I, th those are the things that I, I pull books on because it's, you know, un uncommon and it's not stuff that I keep on the top of my head. So um, short answer is, 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 is no. Um, and uh, I like to use this as an opportunity to um, remind everyone out there that no one knows everything and uh, you know I'm, I'm comfortable with saying I don't know so anything else new comments hello hello <laughs> all righty well um, thank you everyone again I'm not gonna be here next week um, we're going to do our best to have two of us here every time, um, just so that we can uh, 
have different answers on on some of these questions and, and you can ask someone other than me that you know might know more about things like obturator paralysis and uh, uh, canine paroxysmal dyskinesia. Uh, um, so we'll be working on getting you know some other Southeast veterinary neurology neurologists and doctors here. Um, we're actually going to get some other neurologists that uh, don't work at Southeast veterinary neurology just to you know um, spread the love a little bit and um, what else any comments any suggestions again I mean this is this is all for you so um, anything we can do to make this more engaging more fun more value uh, I'm, I'm all for so so please uh, put it in the in the comments and we'll be keeping an eye on it